Welcome and thank you for joining today's conference, Decontamination and Disposal Capabilities Over Time. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the chat panels by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, enter your question in the message box provided and send. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. With that, I'll turn the call over to Elizabeth Fernandez. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. I'm Liz Fernandez with the VF Training, and I would like to welcome you to the webinar today also. Our speaker today is Lori Miller, Senior Staff Officer, Environmental Engineer for USDA APHIS Veterinary Services, Office of Interagency Coordination. She has spent the past 15 years focusing on planning and preparedness for animal disease outbreak response, specifically in the areas of carcass management and biosecurity. And with that, I'm going to turn the webinar over to Lori. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much uh, for joining us today. I'm going to uh, talk to you about decontamination and disposal capabilities over time. So where we started, where we are now, and some ideas for uh, future projects. Um, so in terms of carcass management, if we look back over the past 20 years uh, to 2001, at that point in time, the strategy of the U.S. as well as uh, many other countries around the world was to burn and bury carcasses if there was an animal disease outbreak. Uh, at, in that year, the United Kingdom had a foot and mouth disease outbreak where they employed those strategies and had a, a large number of challenges. And so we looked at their experience, uh, tried to learn from their um, situation, as well as our own outbreaks that we had experienced, and we tried to find safer ways to manage carcasses. And so um, we looked into composting, landfill, uh, and rendering, in addition to burial and burning. And in fact, in 2015, during the largest animal disease outbreak response in U.S. history for avian influenza in the Midwest U U.S., um, we lost nearly 50 million birds. 85% of them were composted. About 8% were landfilled, um, and then the remaining 7% were either buried or incinerated. Uh, in 2020, last year, during the COVID packing plant slowdowns, we found that rendering was uh, a great asset to us for carcass management. And in the future, we're uh, looking at using grinders to help facilitate composting and other disposal technologies. We're looking at hybrid uh, technologies of um, shallow burial with composting, which is also known as above ground burial. And we're also um, curious about our, the capability to grind and then sanitize the carcasses so that they can be managed as non-contaminated. So starting with uh, landfill, and I'm going to be jumping from topic to topic here, so I apologize in advance for that, but I wanted to fill you in on as many um, <clears throat> bits of information as possible. So starting with landfill, uh, late last year, our Center for a um, Epidemiology and Animal Health of USDA published a risk assessment which found there was a low to negligible risk of exposing wild birds to highly pathogenic avian influenza when disposing of them in a landfill. Uh, this activity was low risk if the um, infected carcasses were uh, placed in the landfill with at least 30 feet of waste below the carcasses. Uh, if the landfill was in a relatively cool climate and if the, dispo if the infected flocks were detected from passive surveillance, which would result in a higher viral load in the carcasses. 
And so that was a low risk, and that was uh, typically the um, conditions that we experienced in 2015 when the high path AI birds were landfilled. Uh, that risk goes to very low or negligible um, by increasing the depth of waste beneath the carcasses, uh, by the landfill being in a warmer climate, or if the flocks are detected with active surveillance, which would result in lower viral loading. So that um, risk assessment summary is um, on our website and available uh, upon request if folks would like it. And feel free to just reach out to me and my contact information is available on the last slide. Moving on to above ground burial, which is a process where a trench of about two feet deep is excavated into the soil. About a foot of wood chips are placed in the bottom of the trench. A layer of carcasses is placed on top of the wood chips, and then the carcasses are covered with the soil that's been excavated from the trench. And then the mound is seeded with a seasonally and regionally appropriate uh, grass seed. In collaboration with the Oklahoma State University, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, um, and others, USDA recently completed a large-scale study. Uh, it was uh, a year-long uh, effort, which involved 100 sows. Their femurs were inoculated with a swine pox virus, which we were using as a surrogate for African swine fever. And then uh, periodically over time, the femurs were extracted and the uh, samples were analyzed. What we found was that the surrogate was inactivated within two weeks. The um, leachate from the plots only caused an increase of nutrients to about two feet deep, which is relatively shallow, um, so that was good news to us. No increased scavenger activity was observed through continuous trail cam monitoring. And the carcasses were fully decomposed after a year when the site was returned to its original use. Because of the success of that study, as well as others that looked at um, Seneca Valley virus and um, other uh, viruses with having similar results with uh, this process inactivating the virus within a few weeks' time, uh, we, the USDA National Training and Exercise Program Working Group, which includes uh, folks from state uh, Departments of Agriculture, uh, federal uh, partners, uh, and others to develop this protocol for emergency response. Uh, and the protocol has recently been published. It's available on our website um, or by request. And so we now have a step-by-step -step guide for how to implement above-ground burial in case of an animal disease outbreak. In terms of uh, composting, and particularly in terms of using grinding to, ex to expedite the composting process, we um, collaborated with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, the University of Maine, Virginia Tech, and the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. And we looked at the feasibility of grinding pig carcasses to um, improve disposal efficiency. What we found was that we could process 60,000 pounds of carcasses per hour, and um, that was with putting a load of wood chips on the conveyor belt, followed by a load of carcasses, and alternating uh, in that manner. We were able to reduce the compost time from more than six months for whole carcasses to less than one month for the ground material. And we were able to reduce the windrow, windrow footprint by at least 30 percent. Uh, so we also uh, determined that the method would be really efficient if we had a centralized location where we could set up the grinder and um, the compost windrows. But it could also be used on farm, just that the grinder would have to be uh, cleaned and disinfected 
after it was used at a particular location before it was moved to the next. Uh, one of the big concerns about grinding was would the grinding process produce aerosols or dust that could carry pathogens away from the infected premises and spread an outbreak. So while we were doing the um, demonstration of the grinder, actually we did three uh, different demonstrations with various grinders, um, we worked with EPA to do air monitoring. And so as you can see from this graphic, the grinder is set up on the left-hand side uh, the bottom left shows the wind directions blowing to the northeast, and our highest levels of material, and so what we were tracking was pig DNA, our highest levels were detected directly downwind, and the, the samplers were set up a couple hundred feet away from the grinder. And um, what we did next was working with EPA modelers as well as our own Center for Epidemiology and Animal Health. We converted those um, pig DNA measurements to amount of ASF virus that could be deposited at various locations under various weather conditions at various distances um, from the grinder. And it depends on the amount of time that the grinder is operated. And then we looked at the likelihood or the risk to feral swine that would be uh, around the perimeter of the infected premises where the grinding was taking place. And the initial uh, run uh, of these uh, calculations and models found a 40 to 50 percent infection rate for the feral swine 150 feet from the grinder. So. That, that's pretty close, um, but we used that short distance because many swine operations have um, postage stamp sized properties where most of the land is taken up by buildings and there isn't much room for uh, disposal operations. And so we're repeating these tests to um, apply mitigations to the grinder process. So we're adding deflectors to the conveyor where the ground material comes off, and we're also testing misting systems to reduce uh, airborne particles. And we're planning to do those tests uh, at the end of May. In addition, we're going to be uh, cleaning and disinfecting the grinder and validating what protocols work best so that we can uh, document that and have um, written protocols and best management practices for disinfection. Um, in a related project, also with our colleagues at ETA, we're currently working in the lab to see if it's feasible to grind the carcasses and add um, disinfectants, so commonly available um, additives like citric acid or hydrated lime. Both of these compounds have been shown to reduce pathogens in um, various settings. And so we're testing in the lab to see what happens, how much of this material would we have to add? Is that even economically feasible? Can it be done um, while the grinding is taking place? Many grinders uh, come equipped with dye injection um, systems which are used when they're making colored mulch that you buy at the hardware store. And so we're looking into the possibility of um, using those um, dye injection systems to inject disinfectants instead. Uh, and if the lab testing suggests that it would be feasible to try in the field, then we would um, move away from surrogates and test actual pathogens in a containment lab, and we would also use uh, safe surrogates to test it in the field if it appears that it would be feasible. Also related to grinding and composting, we had some real life lessons learned 
in last spring from the COVID-19 packing plant shutdowns. Uh, one state in particular had quite a large number of um, excess hogs that couldn't go to market. They were perfectly healthy, uh, but they had to be destroyed, euthanized, and then um, they were composted. And so Minnesota set up two centralized locations with grinders and plenty of space for compost windrows. Um, one of the sites, however, was fairly low-lying, and during heavy rains, it flooded, as you can see from this photograph. So that was a lesson learned that the site selection is extremely critical when um, doing centralized processing of carcasses. Another lesson we learned was that as a result of the 42 million birds that were composted in 2015 and the many uh, pigs that were composted in 2020, there is a tremendous amount of finished compost left after um, all the pathogens are gone and the um, material is finished curing. And so the question becomes, what do you do with this? And the concern is that it's a um, waste that has to be disposed of. And it turns out that's not, not the case. Uh, thanks to a colleague at the University of Maine Cooperative Extension, uh, they have uh, reached out to a number of uh, stakeholders to provide guidance, best practices on the use of the finished compost at agronomic rates. And as you can see from the photograph, the addition of compost to crops can really um, have a significant increase in yields. In another project, we uh, learned, and this is through a, an exposure assessment, a series of exposure assessments that were performed by EPA a few years back. Um, we looked at the uh, potential risks from all of the uh, disposal options, landfill rendering, off-site incineration, on-site burial, uh, on-site composting, on-site burning. And, uh, we evaluated the um, potential exposures from those various scenarios. And a surprise finding, or at least it was a surprise to me, was how the uh, most significant exposures were potentially from temporary storage piles. So during an animal disease outbreak response, uh, many animals die of the disease or have to be euthanized, put them out of their you know, to, to prevent further suffering and further um, uh, illness in other flocks or herds. And so the animals are put down and then they're disposed of. And there is often a lag between the time the uh, animals die and the time they are fully contained in the disposal method and the, the management option. And so, um, the risks could be from liquid leachate coming from the bottom of the pile or from odors and exposed carcasses attracting flies, uh, scavengers, and you know, other vectors. And so we're getting ready to kick off a project with Iowa State University where we're going to be looking at uh, different options for containing the leachate, whether it's an impermeable liner or a uh, layer of wood chips underneath and a variety of options over the top of these piles, whether it's hydrated lime or more wood chips or a tarp and, or a combination thereof. Uh, so that is going to be kicking off in April and we're very much looking forward to that project as well. Um, in the uh, last few years, there has been a tremendous interest in um, preparing for African swine fever should it reach the U.S. And one of the big questions that has come up is what do you do with the uh, potentially contaminated slurry lagoons? Uh, and this is not only a concern related to African swine fever, but for any operation that might have these waste lagoons, even some poultry operations uh, or cattle. And so we have two projects that we're 
involved with. Uh, one is in Vietnam in collaboration with the University of Maine, the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality, the National Pork Board, uh, Swine Health Information Center, and the Vietnam uh, National University of Agriculture, where we are looking at, um, they have an ongoing ASF outbreak, uh, tragically, and but they have been so gracious as to allow us to do these projects there with the actual virus. And so uh, we ha will be collecting samples from an infected farm from the lagoon, and we will be um, holding those samples in a fallow condition. And so um, what we mean by fallow is that um, the EU had in the past published guidance that suggested these lagoons, if they were just left um, sitting with no new material coming in for six months, that the ASF virus would die off on its own. Uh, so that period of no influent coming in uh, were terming fallowing. And we want to track the survival of the ASF virus to see how long it actually takes to die off um, when there is no new material coming in. Um, and this is important to us because uh, to have these lagoons sitting for six months could be a problem for us in the U.S., um, which leads to a second project that we're working on, um, also with our colleagues at EPA, which is a feasibility study to look at how to manage excess stormwater um, that could cause these ponds to overflow if they're fallow for six months. And so, um, you know, th this image here on the slide is showing uh, the, a cross section of a typical lagoon and from the left the uh, manure and slurry from the barns would come into the lagoon, the um, solids would settle to the bottom, there would be a treatment zone where usually an anaerobic, anaerobic process goes on which breaks down the waste materials and would serve also to uh, break down viruses and other pathogens. And then there are, is a level that, which is a relatively clear uh, material, although it does have lots of nutrients in it, and that material is often um, drained off and used to land apply a, as a fertilizer for croplands. Obviously, if the material is contaminated with ASF virus, we don't want to uh, apply that to the land. And so um, we would not be removing that layer. Plus, these um, lagoons, many of them are only designed to hold one to three months worth of um, manure, slurry, and rainfall. So if they are left to fallow for six months, they could overflow. So our feasibility study is looking at what to do with that excess runoff uh, or overflow, and um, you know, can it be temporary, temporarily stored in um, tanks? Can it be pulled off, heat treated, and then land applied? Um, or you know, what are the what is the universe of options? And then um, narrowing it down into what which ones are um, economically and uh, logistically feasible. So that is underway. We're looking forward to results of that in the near future. And um, one of the last uh, slides I'm going to share on, on carcass management is related to rendering. And so we um, have found with extensive work with the rendering industry over the years that um, they are designed, rendering plants are designed to manage carcasses. Um, and it's basically a recycling operation. Those carcasses are turned into a myriad of useful byproducts, including um, pet food, animal feed, uh, fertilizers, biofuels. But if we were to send infected carcasses to a rendering plant, it could um, create a problem for those final products, even though the process gets high enough to inactivate any pathogens that we would be concerned about, um, 
it's the concern of cross contaminations within the plant and as well as um, the public perception of not wanting to use pet food that came from contaminated animals. So there are limitations with the rendering industry in terms of um, being available for infected carcasses during an outbreak, but for non-infected carcasses, we found in um, this past spring's COVID-19 pecking plant shutdowns that the re rendering industry was tremendously helpful. They accepted um, approximately a million additional uh, animals beyond their normal capacity. And some plants uh, even installed additional equipment and some added a second shift to meet, a, to meet this demand. So they're very interested in helping. Um, and maybe there is a way that we can work together in the future to um, help them process non-contaminated materials during an outbreak. So for the future, um, based on the work that we have done in the past, we have kind of a list of ideas that we would like to explore in the future. And um, you know, these are not um, already funded. They are not policy. They are not mandated in any way, shape, or form. These are just our ideas of you know, where um, we're thinking to go next. Um, and you know, these ideas are, um, you know, if folks out there listening want to apply for Farm Bill funds and pursue any of these or pursue other ideas that we haven't thought of, you know, that is really the ideal situation where we all come together from our various perspectives to solve this common problem. Uh, so you can see here what um, some of our ideas for the future are. Um, and just kind of hitting the highlights, uh, above ground burial, we would like to validate that with actual disease agents. Um, <clears throat> to this point, we have mostly used surrogates. Uh, we'd like to evaluate grinding to see if that improves the above ground burial performance. <clears throat> Uh, for deep burial, we would uh, like to improve models to predict groundwater impact impacts on a site-by-site -site basis. You know, the, the vision for the future would be a tool, a calculator where an individual could go and put in their site-specific parameters and find out if it would be safe uh, for the number of animals uh, they have. In terms of composting, um, We'd like to uh, continue with the grinder studies, determine if the grinding can be done safely, uh, if we can sanitize during grinding, and uh, a variety of other topics. Uh, on this next slide, we would like to continue to de develop a variety of protocols for the various options, do additional testing, and uh, risk assessments. So let's move to uh, decontamination capabilities over time. In the past, wet cleaning with uh, detergent and water, rinsing, uh, perhaps drying, application of a chemical disinfectant a liquid, uh, in a liquid form for a, uh, a continuous contact time of anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes, um, and then a, another rinse perhaps, which resulted in a, a large amount of wastewater for every vehicle that was disinfected. And in the past, that wastewater often was not contained. Um, moving through time to the present, we are um, concerned about containing that uh, water to make sure that we are not spreading pathogens or contaminants that could be harmful to the environment. Uh, we're looking at um, so reducing the runoff to preventing having to do the vehicle C and D. If we can keep clean vehicles off the infected premises and clean, so perhaps they drop off supplies at the gate and don't enter the infected premises, then they don't have to be disinfected, uh, and that would also help tremendously. Uh, there are technologies looking at heat treatment, foam applications that don't need rinsing, as well as fumigants. 
and for the future, who knows, maybe UV light or other new technologies that will make this um, a much more efficient uh, and sustainable process. So looking at um, various types of DECON processes uh, that we have seen or tested over time. This is a very simple example, but highly effective. A dairy company in North Carolina has a decon package uh, or kit on every milk tanker that leaves their farm. Their kit consists of a, a tarp, some swimming pool noodles, a strainer basket and a sump pump, as well as a pressure washer. And they uh, load the raw milk into the tanker at the farm, go to the processing plant, where, of course, there are many other um, tankers from all over the region, coming from different farms, uh, are dropping their uh, loads to be processed. And in order to avoid cross-contaminating their trucks and potentially tracking pathogens back to their farm, this company then cleans and disinfects their tanker before they leave the processing plant. Uh, this image is from a full-scale exercise we did in California several years ago. And um, it's a contractor who is showing a similar technique. They're using plastic sheeting. They're using, um, they rolled up the edges around absorbent um, booms to make that berm. They're using pressure washers uh, and garden sprayers to, to clean and disinfect and then to clean and then to um, add the disinfectant to the equipment. This is a cattle head restraint shown in the photo. They're using brooms to help push the runoff to the low spot um, of this containment. And then they are using a pump to contain that wash water for proper disposal. This photograph is from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, who did a series of cold weather um, decon field trials. And um, they found that up to 40% propylene glycol mixed with the water uh, used to um, make the disinfectant solutions was still effective down to minus 25 C at um, inactivating the test viruses that they used. So that was a huge finding. Um, they uh, did extensive testing to see how well the different um, techniques work. And another really interesting um, tip that they uh, shared was that if they kept the vehicles in a shed overnight before they had to clean and disinfect them, the vehicles were cold but not frozen, and they would have an easier time of cleaning and disinfecting them in that state. So rather than storing the dirty vehicles outside to put them in a shed before they got treated, it was highly effective. And we are very grateful to them for all the data and uh, knowledge that came out of these projects that they shared with us. Um, next is a photograph of a sort of a um, truck baking setup. So this is a livestock carrier. Um, it looks pretty clean to start. Uh, it is in a uh, building where heat is applied to the inside of the vehicle, and this process was found to be up to 100% effective for the swine enteric coronavirus. Uh, so it has a great deal of promise. And this slide is from 2015 High Path AI, where uh, the vehicle is being disinfected before it leaves an infected premises. Uh, in this situation, the uh, contractor is trying to minimize the amount of water that they're using. They're using, uh, I believe they were using uh, steam cleaners, uh, but I can't tell if they're just straight up pressure washers. Um, but they, um, there's no containment around this vehicle because the wash pad 
slopes back towards the infected premises. So no potential pathogens would be leaving the premises. Um, and the amount of wash water is being minimized. In this next slide, this is the um, result of a student project with the University of Delaware that we commissioned. And um, what the students came up with, they tested a variety of different um, setups, and basically they were given you know, some money. They, they spent less than $300 at the hardware store to buy these components, and this configuration was what they came up with after trying a variety of different uh, setups. It's basically just some two by fours, some plastic sheeting, and some PVC pipe that has some um, holes drilled in it, uh, and literally just connected to a garden hose. And uh, they were able to visibly remove mud from test panels. So this could be a really useful temporary decon station. Um, for a, you know, maybe a farm that's not infected, that's in a control zone. Um, okay, in the next slide, uh, this is more of a more permanent solution. It's an off-the-shelf wheel wash system that was tested in collaboration with the Department of Homeland Security and West Texas A&M University. And um, this setup, uh, was about $100,000, including the equipment as well as uh, the installation. Uh, so it had to be uh, installed into the site. There was some concrete that needed to be poured as well as utilities that were brought uh, to the location. The uh, ranch where it was set up believes that it's going to pay for itself uh, in a very short time because of the savings with not having to go to truck washes as often. Uh, when we tested it, we found that it uh, visibly cleaned the vehicle, but we have not yet uh, had the opportunity to validate it with lab tests to verify that it can remove pathogens. And um, we'd also like to see if it could be um, used with detergent or disinfectant. Uh, this is a photograph of a non-freezing portable vehicle wash tunnel that was uh, developed, a prototype was developed in collaboration with the Department of Homeland Security and the Small Business Innovation Research Program for a uh, small business developer in Huntsville, Alabama. And so this used a um, military-style air beam shelter to contain uh, aerosols as well as to hold um, heat <coughs> inside. Uh, this large gantry system would run back and forth and apply um, a rinse detergent, disinfectant um, to the vehicle, <coughs> and it does contain the wash water. We would like to test this in, in the future. Um, to validate efficacy against a variety of um, pathogens, uh, but it has not yet been commercialized. Now, along with that wash tunnel, the developer also created a prototype robot that would um, be able to climb up into a livestock carrier, um, and this is all remote controlled, so almost like it's a game uh, you know, joystick. Uh, kind of setup controller, game controller, um, enables the operator to run this robot up the ramp into the uh, livestock carrier where it maps the inside of the uh, surfaces and then applies this um, detergent and or disinfectant solutions. Again, just a prototype, um, and it would be interesting to um, further develop and commercialize. So in terms of future project ideas for DECON, you know, validating these various um, automated systems would be great. Uh, we would like to develop a um, grinder cleaning and disinfection protocol, uh, better protocols for uh, C&D of livestock car carriers, 
and also develop a validated footwear decon protocol. And we're really hopeful that a lot of the uh, challenges that we face today will be solved in the future through Farm Bill projects. And so as I said before, the ideas that we have for future work, you know, are not, um, you know, meant to be, you know, the, the roadmap for everybody to follow. These are just our ideas, and we hope that um, folks out there will um, come up with innovative ideas for solving uh, the decon and disposal challenges that we have during the animal disease outbreak. Um, in, in 2019, the Farm Bill uh, funded a total of $5.2 million worth of projects that were um, focused on training and exercises for everything from critical preparedness and response activities to uh, depop disposal and disinfection, biosecurity, and even vaccination plan training. In 2020, uh, the Farm Bill funded about $9.3 million worth of projects. These were not limited just to training and exercise proposals. They were, um, you know, all sorts of methods development and um, innovative proposals covering everything from biosecurity, disposal, depopulation, uh, animal movement, and secure food supply, and virus elimination. So, um, you know, personally, I find these very exciting times uh, to be working together to solve these challenges, and I'm happy to take questions now. Okay. So we have a couple questions in the chat. Um, is AGD approved for use in, fab, in a fab outbreak? And so, um, yes, at this point in time, we have gotten... Uh, we've had a number of studies that show it inactivates pathogens, and so um, we would use it in an animal disease outbreak. The next question is, was the risk of aerosolization of pathogens studied? Yes. And um, the first round, we found that um, without any mitigations on the grinder, like um, deflectors or um, dust suppression, that it has uh, a, a 40 to 50 percent chance of infecting feral swine 150 feet from the grinder. Um, and so we're repeating those tests to, um, with the mitigation to determine if those simple changes can enable us to grind safely. The next question is, was there a concern about aerosolization of virus in the grinding process? Yep. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, now, you know, when we were doing the tests, we weren't using infected animals. Um, so, you know, we used standard health and safety protocols. Um, you know, if there were any naturally occurring pathogens in the carcasses, um, but there were no disease agents there. And so, uh, and it was in a remote setting uh, surrounded by trees, and so there would have been minimal um, spread of any uh, pathogens that could have been naturally occurring. The next question is, in your opinion, are there maximum wind speeds that would prohibit grinding of the swine carcasses due to potential environmental contamination? Uh, so in our discussions on the project, you know, we have talked about 30 miles per, per hour kind of being, um, you know, sustained wind speeds that would be, beyond that would be challenging to do the grinding. Um, but in terms of quantifying that to specific numbers, I would have to um, look at the modeling and the tools that EPA and um, USDA have created, which predict what the risk factors would be at various distances with various wind speeds. Okay. The next question is for the ASFB above ground burial project. Was the temperature kept constant or was this done in environment or in an environment where there was temperature fluctuation overnight? Um, it was done outdoors in um, 
uh, you know, in the natural environment at, for a year. So it wasn't just daily temperature fluctuations, but seasonal fluctuations as well. And that was in Oklahoma um, where the um, plots were subjected to, you know, the full gamut of weather conditions. Um, and <clears throat> what we found was that the above ground burial plots themselves where the carcasses were buried um, maintained a temperature that was at least a few degrees up to 10 degrees warmer than the uh, native soil near the above ground burial plots. Um, we did see um, activity in terms of um, you know, temperatures sort of reducing during the cold months, um, but that picked up again as the spring uh, set in. Have the temperatures been measured in the carcasses during above ground burial? Uh, yes. And as I um, say, we found them to be about 10 degrees, up to 10 degrees higher than the native soil. So we're um, hypothesizing that there is a temperature um, component to the mechanisms that are inactivating viruses, uh, but there are also um, microbiological uh, factors at play. And so as the carcasses decompose, there are microorganisms that are consuming the proteins and lipids. And vir like, for example, ASF virus, the um, envelope is made of proteins and lipids, and so those same microorganisms would likely also be um, consuming the virus envelope. So not just a matter okay. of temperature. How does soil types affect the decontamination process? Um, decontamination, well, so we don't typically decontaminate soils outdoors. Uh, can you read the question again? It says, how do soil types affect the decon process? Examples, clay, sand, loam. So I'm not... So if the question is referring to soil being on equipment and then that equipment is being decontaminated, um, I'm not sure that anybody has studied soil type related to decon um, on equipment. It's been studying the total amount of soil that is removed during decon, and it's been quantified by tracking the amount of, um, you know, surrogate viruses on test coupons applied to the vehicles that are used to um, determine log reduction in the, um, you know, in the pathogens. Um, in terms of, in case the, the commenter is asking about um, above ground burial and soil type, um, we have tested it in many different um, climates, regions, soil types, um, and our, the data is pretty consistent across the board. Okay, were there any problems with punctures in the plastic sheeting used to contain disinfectant? Um, so in temporary setups that we did, for example, in California, we tested some different um, variations. Uh, we used two by fours in the um, on the plastic. So we laid down the plastic um, and then draped it over two by fours so that it would create a bermed area. And what we found was that as vehicles drove over the plastic on top of the two by fours, it did get torn up. Um, the swimming pool noodles didn't have that same effect. And the um, um, The absorbent booms that the contractor used in one of the photographs also um, reduced the um, abrasions to the plastic. Um, but there are the Canadian photograph that I had showed um, had a much more robust plastic berm sort of drive-through containment that um, is available. You know, you can purchase it from supply stores. 
Um, and so there are specifically designed units that are more robust than the hardware store variety that we showed. Um, the one that we use for our non-freezing portable vehicle wash tunnel was very robust, um, was purpose-built, and, and did not have problems with tearing. We um, did a test on that wash tunnel where we ran uh, thousands of vehicles through it over a year's time. Um, we, we found we could do a vehicle every 30 minutes, and we did not find any de degradation of the, um, the pad, the, the plastic pad. Okay, this is kind of a long one here. A 120-day fallow period was used during the recent Southern California VND outbreak and response with little documentation on its effectiveness. Might have been a good, might have been a perfect time to use the outbreak to determine the effectiveness, necessary length of time, et cetera. Are there any plans to determine if a fallow period of X amount of time actually works? Um, yes. So. Um, Thank you to the commenter. Um, yep, you know, outbreaks are, um, you know, a great opportunity to collect data for sure. Um, I would um, think that the warm temperatures in Southern California would um, help inactivate the Newcastle disease virus quickly. Uh, so, you know, on the face of it, 120 days for a um, you know, Southern California setting may be completely reasonable. We are collecting data with Vietnam uh, where we are looking to see how fast the virus degrades over time um, in those lagoons. And so when the lagoon is operating normally, you have um, wastewater coming in and you have the, you know, cleaner effluent going out that gets land applied. So it's a, um, an ongoing process that is continually turning over. If you stop the influent and stop the effluent, that lagoon goes, um, it, it, you'll have a buildup of ammonia and it goes um, anoxic, so without oxygen, and that would tend to um, it's going to kill the microorganisms that break down the waste materials, and it's likely to also kill uh, pathogens. And so we're hoping to gain that data from our study in Vietnam. Okay. Is the CFIA study with propylene glycol published at this time, or can the information be shared? Uh, yes, it's published, and um, uh, it's on our website, I believe, um, and we can uh, certainly share it. Okay. Is this off-the-shelf wheel wash able to accommodate larger tractor-trailer-sized vehicles as well? You could get ones that would, yes. Um, I don't know, recall the cost for that. This is a great compliment. Well done, Lori, and great to document the research opportunities. Um, can educational programs for routine mortality composting for producers be requested under the Farm Bill funding? I believe they can. Well, so the Farm Bill has eligible entities, so it has rules about who is eligible to apply for funds. Um, industry directly is not eligible, um, but associations, industry associations are eligible. So if, for example, um, you know, National Poultry Association or, you know, National Pork Board wanted to apply for funds to put on training for producers, that would be eligible. Um, another uh, way that could be done is if uh, the trainers, like the universities, request funding to do the training and then could um, – invite producers, and in fact, that is being done with a number of the projects from 2019 and 2020 that were funded. So um, in, in one project, well, so at least, I know of at least four states where composting training is being planned as soon as 
um, in-person meetings are allowed again. Um, and those locations uh, are currently California, Oklahoma, Iowa, and North Carolina. And I believe there are others. Um, I, I, I just don't know that I'm off the top of my head. Okay, when you are decontaminating sites with lagoons, do the fluids from decontamination drain back to the lagoon or is a secondary containment area created? If it drains to the lagoon, what impact does that have on storage and length of time for virus decomposition? I'm sorry, so can you repeat it again? Sorry about that. Sure. No, it's okay. So when you are decontaminating sites with lagoons, do the fluids from decontamination drain back to the lagoon or is a secondary containment area created? Uh, so uh, I'm understanding the question to be that you have an outbreak, you have infected animals in the barn, you, um, they have died or been euthanized, they're removed from the barn, and then you go in and clean and disinfect the barn. And um, then the wash water, the wastewater from the um, building cleaning and disinfection could go to the lagoon. Um, and it, it, depending on the condition of the lagoon when the outbreak occurs, so let's say, for example, the uh, lagoon had just been emptied, you know, or drawn down for land application and it had a lot of space in it and there hadn't been much rain and, you know, you had lots of room. Um, at that point, then, it, you, you could possibly allow that wash water to go to the lagoon. On the other end of the spectrum, if the um, lagoon had not been drawn down, it was at its maximum capacity when the outbreak occurred and you know, you're coming into the rainy season, then you might have to have other means to store uh, and dispose of the wash water from the building. Okay, has there been any study or adaptation of a grout AGV to poultry disease mortality? For example, does grinding address the issues with the feathers? Uh, so I'm not aware of um, above ground burial being used with poultry. Um, we have not really thought a lot about grinding poultry because they're already fairly small and compost quickly. So I would anticipate that the poultry would also break down quickly um, and fully in an above ground burial plot. So this is just my conjecture and we haven't tested it yet. Um, but the way the above ground burial works is you create the plots, you place the carcasses, you cover them over, and after a year, it's basically gone. I mean, you know, natural decomposition processes are um, supported and are very efficient at breaking things down. And so you would just level out the site and go on about, you know, return it to its normal use. And so if there were feathers and such associated with the carcasses in the above ground burial plot, they would remain buried. Okay. Could there be a temporary structure placed over the grinder to decrease the risk of aerosolization? Yep, absolutely. Um, and that is, you know, so a, a lot of um, what we think about when we are doing these projects is how is it going to apply in the field? Um, you know, we don't want to be creating um, technologies that sound great on paper or in the laboratory but are useless in the field. So, you know, we also think about what's happening during an outbreak. And so the, the simpler the better. Um, if there is a widespread outbreak, resources of all kinds are going to be stretched. Um, and so we want to minimize equipment and um, materials that would be needed. So if we can do away with bringing in water, that's better than having something that requires water. Um, likewise, if we can avoid having a big shelter around the grinder, that's better uh, than not. 
Um, so our work is geared towards already available deflector units that come with the grinders. It's just like an extra accessory you can order. Um, testing the ones that already come with the grinders to simplify that process. Um, but if we find that that is not, um, doesn't do the job and we need more rigorous containment and if it makes sense to do that type of containment at a centralized location where bringing in that extra structure makes sense, then, you know, that would absolutely uh, be something we would look at. It's all going to be a trade-off, cost-benefit, and logistical, um, you know, question. Have any of these procedures been evaluated for prion diseases, such as BSE, CWD? Um, so incineration, for sure, um, is the, the global standard for inactivation of prions. Um, we have tested it with mobile incinerators. It's been uh, tested with, um, you know, large, full-scale municipal-type incinerators. So we know that works. <clears throat> there has been a lot of study uh, in Canada using composting and prions, and the, the results are partial breakdown, but not complete. And okay. uh, that's you know, pretty much the only ones I can think of. Yeah. And we have not tested the more, um, like the above ground burial. So site selection is critical for composting and even for AGB, for what we know. What are the most important criteria to be considered, or is there a comprehensive list available? Yes, we have comprehensive lists. So <clears throat> we have... Um, Poultry composting protocol, we have a livestock poultry, I mean, a livestock composting protocol, and we have the above ground burial protocols all posted on our website. And those protocols have detailed lists of um, the, the criteria for selecting a site. Um, we also have a farm bill project that's starting up uh, shortly with Texas A&M University where they will be developing a calculator to help people select a site uh, for centralized composting. Okay. Which disinfectants are currently being used for avian influenza, and how are these disinfectants uh, are being disposed of? So Vercon S has been uh, kind of, you know, an industry standard for disinfection over time because it is a, wide, a broad spectrum. It gets, you know, the vast majority of animal diseases that we worry about. Um, and it's you know, readily available. And it also breaks down on um, contact with soil. So it has been through rigorous, um, you know, uh, ecological assessments and, you know, it, it breaks down into uh, harmless components if it soaks into the soil. Um, if it was to be discharged directly into a stream, it could harm aquatic life. Um, so that is, you know, discouraged. And uh, protocols, uh, protocols we have uh, specifically call out not to discharge any type of disinfectants into streams. Um, but our protocols also specify that those conversations should be had with the local um, regulatory agencies. So whether it's public health or the State Department of Environment, um, wherever the outbreak is occurring, this, the, the, um, what to do with the wash water should be discussed in advance. And so ideally, every production facility in the U.S. would have their own emergency plan for how they would dispose of not only the carcasses, but also wastewater from disinfection and how they would disinfect and so forth. And we do have templates on our website that could help people develop those plans. Okay. So we're starting to get to the end of our time. We do still have some questions, but what I'm going to suggest is that we will get these questions um, from WebEx 
and I can submit them to you, Lori, um, for you to answer if that works for you. That would be great. I'd be happy to. Okay. So with that, I'd like to thank Lori on behalf of the VS National Training and Exercise Program for presenting today. We will be sending out additional announcements for upcoming webinars. And as a reminder, if you guys have any ideas for webinars that the VS NTEP can explore for future emergency preparedness community um, a topic, please feel free to contact us. Um, and with that, I will tell you all, have a great afternoon, and thanks again, Lori. Thank you so much. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using AT&T Event Services. You may now disconnect.